Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining. As I said before the break, a vitally important conversation here on your Feel Good Breakfast Show. And as we bask in our beautiful sunny days, I mean, it's a 39 in Uppington. Sure. It gives you an indication. It is crucial to chat about skin care. Sunburn and, of course, it's a sneaky sidekick. Skin cancer. I think that's got your attention. Now, did you know that South Africa has some of the highest UV levels around? We feel it when we're outdoors, and this puts us at a very significant risk for skin cancer, one of the most common forms of cancer worldwide. It was recently announced that even Sarah Ferguson, the former wife of Prince Andrew, has had her brush with skin cancer, bringing it into firm focus. And we've got um, Professor Ranakuel Lechlorenya now here to share some light on this hot topic. Excuse the pun. Prof, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we appreciate what you do every day, but today in particular for joining us and our viewers. Thank you so much. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Prof, I think a lot of us would like to know exactly how can you identify skin cancer? Is it perhaps, you know, a mole that has appeared out of nowhere? Mm. How do we know we need to go have ourselves checked? Well, there's different types of skin cancer, and I think most of the focus has been on melanoma, which is really the most lethal of the, of the whole lot. And the way to recognize a melanoma, the simple principle is what you call A, B, C, D, E of melanoma. So if you have a mole, A stands for asymmetry, B stands for irregular borders, C stands for multiple colors. Okay. D stands for diameter more than six millimeter. And E stands for evolution. Okay. That's only for melanoma. So it doesn't make you a dermatologist, but <laughs> if you've got a mole that is those characteristics, then it's important to go and get them looked, get it looked at. The other types of skin cancer are slightly different. So for example, a basal cell carcinoma is called, it has what you call contact bleeding. When you touch it, if you've got a mold that every time you touch it, it, it bleeds, bleeds okay. then it tells you that it's a basal cell carcinoma. It's not as lethal as a melanoma, but it's still a form of skin cancer. And then in between is another squamous cell carcinoma, I mean what's called squamous cell carcinoma. So they're slightly different. But I think the most important one, which is most lethal, is a melanoma that that ABCD gives you a very good guide in terms of what to look out for. But you still have to have your regular checkup because some of them, the nuances, would need somebody to get checked. Generally, the rule of thumb in somebody with a light skin or white skin above the age of 40, you've got to see somebody once a year. Okay. Okay. That's sort of the rule of thumb. The risk in younger people is less, but we are seeing more and more and more younger people actually getting melanomas. Um, and because the conditions ain't changing. If anything, it's getting hotter. I think this yeah. will probably be the hottest year recorded. Certainly. Uh, I, certainly. I have a sense. Um, and certainly in our neck of the woods, it's getting worse. Um, so thank you for breaking it down. Like, mm -hmm. I love the fact that we can be proactive. It does mm -hmm. speak to us being then proactive and doing our regular checks. And if we are prone to a lot of moles and, and freckles. But I, I really want to take this a step back. When we talk about um, the devastating effect effects of melanoma in particular. What is actually happening within the body? Why is this such a dangerous form of cancer? What is actually going on in terms of our biology? Uh, and why is this so dangerous? So by definition, a, a cancer is a cell that does not obey standard rules. Uh -huh. So for example, if you've got an eye, an eye will be in a specific place. But the cells which really are make up of your body, the bricks that make up your body, sometimes they have what are called mutations. They don't obey the standard rules. So when cells touch each other, they know when to stop growing. They know that they don't belong in certain areas. They are stimulated by certain areas. They are inhibited by certain areas. They so what happens, <laughs> yeah, so they just don't obey the rules at all. And what you see in that A, B, C, D, E is a classic feature of cells that are not obeying rules as they should be. So what happens is that once the cells uh, don't obey rules, they are found in places where they should not be and then they start to impair function. So if 
one of the things that those cells will develop is ability to migrate and go to places where they shouldn't be. That's when you start to call metastasis. Your melanocytes, which are the cells that melanoma arises from, should be on your skin. You've got them a little bit in the brain, you've got them around the eyes. But then they will end up in the brain or in the heart or in the liver where they shouldn't be. Okay. Then they start to affect the function of your normal organs. Melanoma is when they change, those cells are much more aggressive, for example, than the basal cell carcinoma, which doesn't really spread. Almost weaponized. Exactly, yeah. so they're weaponized. So they change and they become aggressive and they go to places where they shouldn't be. That's the major problem that they arise okay. from them. Yeah. Well, Prof, we see, especially on social media, a lot of young individuals and even older folk want to get the tan. They spend so much time in the sun. <laughs> Is it a case of simply wearing sunblock? You're protecting yourself or how can we prevent these skin cancers from happening? Is it possible to prevent it? So the, the risk of skin cancer varies with your skin type. Sure. So people with very, very dark skin, they've got a minimal risk of getting skin cancer, even though it still happens. But people with albinism, for example, they're the most prone because they've got no melanin at all. And redheads, like Sarah Ferguson, as you mentioned, exactly the same kind of a problem. So she's much more prone to skin cancer than somebody who is a brunette, for example. For sure. So it's, it's a matter of protection. But I think the most important thing is the times that you spend out in the sun. You need the sun for your mood. You need the sun for a whole lot of different things. But the best time to go out into the sun is before 11 in the morning and after 3 in the afternoon. Because when the sun hits you at right angles, it's much more intense. That's why people who bold, you can be bold for There's 10 no years. Refraction. It's all exactly. straight. It's, it's like a straight laser, straight in. Right. in. Yeah, exactly, yeah. straight in. So that's always the best time to be out in the sun. S sunscreen is useful, but it's expensive. Yeah. It's, it's sure. unaffordable to the bulk of the yeah, people who did there. And just protection, normal heads when you are out there, long arms. But at the same time, the idea of being completely out of the sun it's, it's, it's impractical. Need you need the sun, you need it for your mood, you need yeah. for a whole lot of other things. So it is important to be able to be out in, in the sun and functionally we do that. But long sleeves ahead, but at the other times, it's much, much safer to be, to be out there. Um, oh, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Professor Lechloenya is not going anywhere. If you've got any questions regarding skin cancer, skin care, any major alarm bells going off in your world, we want to hear from you right now. You can hit us up on all of our social media platforms. Hashtag Expresso Show. Now, of course, cricket players don't really have a choice. They've got to be out there all day in the sun, which is why they wear the long baggy whites, OK? Um, but, of course, they also have to condition their bodies to be able to play that game. And right now, Ryle is going to do exactly exactly that. It's my feel -good Oh, welcome back after that amazing performance from Art Matthews. Don't worry, we'll have more, but we're going to bring it back home. In fact, keep it really personal, as it is a Health Tuesday on your Feel Good Breakfast show. And earlier in the show, we touched on the topic of skin cancer. And did you know that it was recently announced that Sarah Ferguson, former wife of Prince Andrew, has had her brush with skin cancer? And I love the fact that that, on one side at least, albeit a very dark diagnosis, does bring more attention to this. And um, we we have got the prof in the studio, Professor Lechloenya, here to shed some light on this very hot topic. And remember, South Africa's very high UV levels mean that we are more exposed than others to skin cancer risks. Prof, thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Thank you. Prof, I want to put myself in the shoes of an individual that now has gone for the test and they were told you now have skin cancer. What are the next steps for those individuals? So normally when somebody has got skin cancer, the first thing you need to do is take a sample of skin. So you, as a dermatologist or doctor, you suspect somebody has got a skin cancer. You take a piece of skin, you send it to the lab. That is important to prognosticate, to determine exactly what kind of cancer it is and how aggressive it is. The further away from normal it is under the microscope, the more dangerous it is. Therefore, that's important. Also, if you've taken a small sample, because sometimes we are wrong, and if I take your whole nose off and then I come and tell you, sorry, it wasn't a cancer in the first place, that's not really the best way to go about things. <laughs> so once you have done that, then the pathologist will tell you, okay, it's this kind of a cancer, it's this severe, 
Therefore, when you cut it out, how much can you cut out? Because the most important thing is that when you remove it, you've got to remove it with adequate margins on the sides and adequate margins beneath. and then beneath. Yeah. So that is important. So that helps you to go on and then get it done. Under normal circumstances in privileged societies, plastic surgeons or most surgeons will take it all out. And then depending on how aggressive it is. So for example, for a melanoma, You've got to be seen every three months for the first two years. Okay. Every six months between because year three and five, because it can recur. Okay. And then after five years, your risk is almost normal. But if you've had the melanoma before, you have the highest risk of getting another one. Okay. Okay. And similarly, if you've got a family member who has had a melanoma, a first degree relative, which means it's somebody who shares 50% of your genes, your brother, your siblings, your parents, and your children, they then have a higher risk. So you follow them up. So the important thing is that once you have had it, you need to have a regular follow up because your risk is higher than normal and, of getting it. And I care. wouldn't suggest that this is a curse. If anything, it's an opportunity to know more and prevent. So if you have cancer in your family, don't think of it as a yoke that's hanging over you, no. but rather the indication that you need to get checked regularly, that you need to take special care, that you can be more proactive in that space. When we talk about a melanoma spreading to other areas, when does that or how does that treatment plan shift and change? When do we start moving away from just removing the cancerous area to chemotherapy, more aggressive forms of treatment? Talk us through that journey of how it can progress on the negative side of the scale. So normally once the diagnosis has been made, you tend, the first step would be to look at the glands. So normally the glands drain. You know, if you kick something, For you sure. feel pain in those glands that are there. So the first place where, if it spreads, will be through those glands, which serve as filters of everything that should get into your the body. Lymph nodes and yeah, so that's like called that. the okay. sentinel lymph node. If the sentinel lymph node is negative, then it's unlikely to spread anywhere else. Once it's got to the sentinel lymph node, then there's a reason to worry that it just got spread. Then you try to dissect that whole sentinel lymph node and remove that whole basin. And melanoma care has evolved quite rapidly over the last few years. It's gone beyond chemotherapy. Chemotherapy used to be, it's like if there's a fly on the wall and use a wrecking ball to kill the yeah, fly. Yeah, like the shotgun effect. everything else the in there. It's a shotgun yeah. effect. But right now we've got more targeted therapies. And targeted therapies target specific mutations within the cell. So there are certain melanomas with certain characteristics that respond to certain treatments. At the moment, those treatments are extremely expensive, mm. but the next step will be then in under resource settings, you use chemotherapy as far as you can. But in more advanced societies, there are specific targeted therapies that are actually showing very good results, improving five-year survival. In the past, five-year survival once it has spread was very, very, very poor. But now we are starting to see quite significant improvement in outcomes as we learn more and more and more and more and more about, about cancer, melanoma. Can, can I be very cheeky yeah. and ask you, of the percentage of South Africans, when we talk about quite a nuanced approach to treatment, quite a targeted approach, how many South Africans have access to that level of care right now? <sighs> I, it's probably less than 1%, and sure. that, that's, that, that's the problem. The, it's that it's exceptionally expensive at this stage, and as all new therapies are, the prices become prohibitive. But then as they become more accessible, uh, prices tend to go lower as more companies produce similar competing products, mm. the prices tend to come lower. But at this stage, they are accessible. People still, some of my patients still fly out to the US to get sure. some of these treatments, and then they are prominent South Africans who in the past have actually travelled over overseas earlier on to try to get those therapies, but now they're starting, they're starting to have better access to them. Yeah, because often mm -hmm. I think I've found in our sort of vantage point, not being medically blessed, but having this, this bird's eye view, often it's the system that needs to change, not the medication. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you are voicing that opinion. But of course, we opened it up to you guys to share your thoughts as well. And thank you so much for weighing in with your comments. Let's see what you have to say. Okay, well, let's take a look at this comment that came 
came through. It says, Melody says, I love this. Thank you so much for putting this on the, the show. I got two children um, diagnosed with um, albinism. albinism. Wow. My 10-year-old daughter got two moles um, that the enlarge in size. I gave um, birth to them in a public hospital and had to educate myself on albinism. Now, with my, two, with my daughter, um, I was not informed that she was diagnosed with albinism at her birth, but as two years, um, at a two year, I went and I had to educate myself because she is very light skinned. Now I have a son that also is much, um, also it looks like, um, got albinism. Um, and we've spoken about pigmentation. You mm. say darker skins obviously are at less risk. So maybe this is a twofold question for mm. you. Um, with very light skin, uh, especially when it extends to albinism, what precautions must one take when she talks about the adequate education? Let's educate people right now. What do you need to know if you have a child with an extremely light skin or pushing into that alb albinism space? How do you protect a skin that is that delicate? And this is the problem. I think, in fact, I received an email to try to develop a package for care of people living with albinism in the Western Cape because we don't. We've, we've actually failed them over the, over the years. I mean, I was in Tanzania last week and the problems there are even worse because of how albinism is perceived. Mm. The, the biggest problem is that people with albinism do not have melanin. The sole function of melanin is to protect you against ultraviolet radiation. Therefore, they've got the highest risk. And that risk goes, starts from the eyes, it's on the skin, because they're at a higher risk of getting all the three different types of skin cancer. So the first thing that we need to do, and which is what I'm working on at the moment, is to develop a program of teaching parents and caregivers how to protect their children against the skin. They should not wear caps on their own because if you look at the back of the neck, you need to have those caps Night that will cover the, the oh. back of the neck, the ears and in all those areas. They should be wearing spectacles with UV protections or sunglasses with UV protections. That's the first step. But the second step is that at some point, almost inevitably, somebody with albinism will get some form of a skin they cancer. They will be affected. And it's access. It's making it easier for them to access care mm. routinely, which means that it's got to go beyond them coming in when they need to come in. It's about finding a system of going to them so that there is regular screening and annual screening because the one thing that works best for cancer is to try to catch it before it becomes a problem. And I think the responsibility that we all have is to try to improve access because if we could do that then it means that then you get an interactions where parents and the patients themselves or the people living with albinism themselves are taught on how to do because if you don't have that interactions with healthcare givers then then it's going to be it's, it's, it's a problem we catch them when it's just too late to and, 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 and we know how much of a fine line that is so thank you so much for putting your heart and soul literally into what you do every day so much of this doesn't speak to medical advancement it speaks to information sharing it speaks to empowering patients with the right knowledge and it speaks to this entire medical fraternity and those of us that are the mouthpiece for it raising our game and i think we've had it mentioned already i love the sound of a starter pack when someone is born at risk that we can start the conversation then but i think all of us need to take a firm focus on the sun and what it can do for us and all of these warning signs the abc's literally of it we'll keep them on our, on our social media platforms but please if you've got comments questions um some great ideas for us continue to share them at expresso show is the handle to use prof you're an absolute gem thank you sir thank you thank, thank you very much